I thought Mississippi burning was a serious distortion of the truth, a serious distortion of history. Mississippi burning was pure bullshit. What's wrong with these people? <laughs> We, we wanted to tell the story in our way as honestly as we could and uh, as powerfully as we could. And um, what people thought of the movie afterwards was up to them. I shout for victory. So what he's done is he's taken, he's stolen the reality and he made it his reality. Can you smile when the bulldozer in on the black kid's body? Can you? All are going to the funeral of black men who have been murdered by white men. The FBI wanted to see themselves in, in a certain light, and they, they did a movie to show themselves in that light. But it had nothing to do with what we were doing. In the Mississippi River, you can count them the movie Mississippi Burning was very powerful and intense. It portrayed the murders of three civil rights workers, James Cheney, Michael Schwerner, and Andrew Goodman. The movie was accurate as far as showing the violence and the racism at that time, but the way they portrayed the FBI as heroes and the degrading portrayal of blacks raised questions in our minds about reality and fiction. Another question that was unanswered was, where was the civil rights movement? which was very strong at that time. Those who don't know about the Civil Rights Movement and saw the movie might think that what the movie represented was history. We, as Bronx High School students, part of the Through Our Eyes Video and History Project, decided to find out the truth for ourselves. We went on a quest, starting from just reading material to actually being there in Mississippi, where it all happened. 1964 wasn't just a time of racism. It was also a time of unity. The civil rights organizations, SNCC, SCLC, CORE, and the NAACP came together to form COFO, Council of Federated Organizations, to organize the Mississippi Freedom Summer Project. Over a thousand young volunteers came from the North to help blacks to register to vote and to run freedom schools. Ben Cheney told us about the Freedom Summer. Uh, the Freedom Summer, the Freedom Summer sort of like highlighted the entire movement up until that point. There was a movement going on long before the Freedom Summer. There was a movement going on in the South. <clears throat> black people were suffering. Black people were, were aggressive and voicing their disagreement, their, dis their, dis their dislike for the system at the time. And the fact that black people were dying, were being killed by the Klan every day. Black people were demonstrating, being beaten every day by cops. The reason that the Freedom Summer highlighted all that because white students got involved from the North and naturally the media followed those white students to the South. These are photographs taken at Oxford, Ohio and this shows um, the students who went down there uh, from all over the country. And that's, that's him right here. Yes, uh, this is a picture of Andy. Actually, this is a close-up of the same thing. Uh -huh. This is a photograph showing what they did is they, they did play acting. Yeah. And uh, they were pretending to be uh, rednecks yeah. harassing the uh, civil rights workers. And uh, as I told you, Andy loved to act. So <laughs> he, he was, this is Andy right here. Uh -huh you know, calling out all kinds of names and harassing the, uh, the workers and uh, because they wanted to give them a pretty good idea about what they would be up against. Right. Let's talk about the Freedom Summer. What role did you play? Well, let me see if I can give you the scenario of the Freedom Summer. I was in the Freedom Singers and we had just come down from the, south, from the north. We were the group who organize all the people in the north. When we would come to northern universities to sing, we would talk about what we wanted to do in the south. And from that, young students decided they wanted to come down to the south. So when I was in Oxford, Ohio, when I first came to the campus, I looked up and I saw the students, and I saw I knew most of them. That frightened me. 
frightened me that I knew most of them because I knew what they were up against. It frightened me that uh, I had told them something that would make them want to do what they were doing. I was both glad and sad. We were there for a week of orientation. And in that week, uh, we listened to the experiences of SNCC staff people. And uh, I guess you could say we were actually put in touch with the reality of Mississippi. And um, to tell you the truth, I was basically petrified. I remember getting, um, us getting a telephone call, at least one, from Mississippi. We didn't know at the time, telling us to come on down. There was a 20-foot pit waiting for us. And, you know, periodically there would be other threatening kinds of messages that came on the telephone. And um, we were basically trying to work through that veil of fear. When we left uh, Oxford, Ohio, we went um, south by bus. And we were singing and giggling and, you know, acting like young people act. And when we got to the Mississippi State Line, which was about 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning, it was pitch black outside. I mean, we literally, everybody stopped singing. And the reality of being in Mississippi and knowing that some of the people who were going to be on the bus, with, who were on the bus with us, would probably not be returning, sank in. The Freedom Schools were started uh, late in June. Probably they really didn't open the doors until the beginning of July. And they ran through towards the end of August, not the very end of August, because the main focus of the whole summer was to go to Atlantic City where the Democratic Party was meeting and to challenge the seating of the, the segregationist uh, Democratic Party. We taught ideas that were part of supporting the, the freedom movement and the voter registration drive, and we integrated whole families into a movement that was uh, political, it was economic, it was social, it was fun, it was cultural. The Freedom School was mostly kids in the community I was about. I was between ages of 11 and 12 during the time, and we would go there, we would <coughs> read, stories would be read to us, we would type a little bit. Uh, just being exposed to some things that kids in a rural community in the South are not exposed to. Um, we played ping pong, we played games, we played constructive games, and we were just taught to do things with our hands and, and to use our minds in a way that ordinarily would not, would not have been taught to use, to do. There was um, a lot of kids. We had, that was about 30 kids. They used to come to this freedom school every day during the summertime. And we just had a lot of good times. Muriel Tilling has shared her experiences organizing the voter registration drive. So when you went into a town, you were given a name very often. You worked with that person. When that person felt that you were solid and they were solid with what you had to offer, then they would tell you to go see another person. And that's how we built the movement. The movement was, was built very slowly because people um, did, in fact, take their lives in their hands with doing something as simple as coming to a meeting. So that was not taken very lightly. And to have a church with 150 people in it meant that you had spent many man hours on each person and they had come to a personal resolve that this was something that they wanted to do and they felt that th this, was the, this was the way to do it. Mm -hmm. On June 21, 1964, James Cheney, Andrew Goodman, and Michael Schwerner disappeared after investigating the burning of the Mount Zion Methodist Church in Philadelphia, Mississippi. The first call Andy made, he was assigned to Canton, Mississippi. And then a couple of nights later, just before they left for Mississippi, he called to say that a church had burned in Philadelphia, Mississippi, and um, that James Cheney, who lived nearby in Meridian, and Mickey Schwerner, who was working in Meridian, wanted to investigate the burning of the church because there was a freedom school in the church, and they wanted to know what happened, and they asked for a volunteer. And they, they told the, the, the students that it was a dangerous mission because Mickey had been down there working since the early part of the year and that the Klan was looking for him because the Klan said there's nothing worse than a, a, a Jew who's working with, I don't even like to use the word, mm. blacks, but anyhow. Um, and they, they were after him. But somebody had to go, and Andy volunteered to go. Now, when they actually disappeared, we must have heard about it on... Well, they heard about it in the middle of the night on Sunday night. And Rita was with 
us in Oxford, Mickey's wife. And the next morning, I remember people coming up and saying, well, there are three guys who are missing in, uh, in Philadelphia. And I can't say that I thought that they were dead. But of course, a lot of people did know. I mean, they sort of knew. And then the next day, they found the car. And the, the car was burned to a crisp. And of course, then everyone knew. And at that moment, my former husband, who is an, a native Alabaman, by the way, uh, went with Rita back into Mississippi. And she, if you talk about a heroine, she was one. And she knew her husband was dead. And she, the, what she would say to the press over and over again, she'd say, um, if this had been just James Cheney, you wouldn't be as interviewing me now. What was the impact on the people in Oxford, Ohio, when they heard about the disappearance of the three civil rights workers? When we heard it, uh, they came in the room and said, uh, they told me, Matt said, uh, uh, we don't know where they are. And we would, uh, they are missing. So we knew deep down within our heart that they were dead. We knew they were gone. But we could not admit that to ourselves. Now, some of the volunteers, uh, left because their mothers told them to leave, their fathers told them to leave, and some were afraid, but, but the majority of them stayed. The good thing about it is that those who stayed were prepared to go, um, uh, to prepared to go all the way. I really believe right down to the point until I saw them put the coffin in the grave that there was a possibility he was alive. Death didn't register on me until that moment. I had thought the day that he left to go to Philadelphia, Mississippi, he told me he was going to come back and he has always kept his word to me. So I figured that he would be back. As a mother, I didn't want to believe it. Right. And it took a long time before I, I, because Andy had said, and he had been told by the, by the civil rights workers who were here in New York recruiting that you know, tell your family that, uh, uh, first of all, that people will call if they have any idea where you live and say that something happened to you. And, um, uh, you know, I was hoping that maybe he'd been kidnapped. And we had people calling us asking for ransom money and all kinds of things. Mm -hmm. And um, I helped for a long time. And I think everybody else knew that he was, um, that they were dead, but I found it harder to accept until very close to the time when their bodies were found. No more dying, no more dying, no more dying over me. And before I'll be a slave, I'll be buried in my grave and go home to my Lord and be free. Oh, I'm gonna sit at the welcome table. Oh, Lord, I'm gonna sit at the welcome table on one of these days. Hallelujah now. I'm gonna sit at the welcome table. I'm gonna sit at the welcome table one of these days. As a part of our analysis concerning Mississippi burning, we heard different people's views. The film's producer and civil rights activists had different opinions about the portrayal of the FBI's dedication in the investigation and search. With all of the controversy about the film, the film is uh, reasonably accurate. I mean, we would always attempt to we would always quote Faulkner. It's not the facts that interest us, but the truth. Um, but the fact of the matter is that uh, the film is reasonably accurate. We did not attempt to make a docudrama. We changed the names to protect the guilty. And we, uh, we made no effort to, 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 to tell the story in every, with, it, with precision in every way. But the fact is that it was, a, at least when the investigation was the, was the white FBI and the white Ku Klux Klan. You know, they talk about these docudramas, and there's a very thin
thin line between what actually happened and what they're pretending happened. But in Mississippi Burning, the director, Parker, and the producer, Zalo, they used, uh, they designed shots that were from actual photographs. See, they claimed that this was fictional, but they, they had three guys, they had one had a beard. I mean, there, there were so many details that corresponded to reality that it confused people. And you, you reminded me when you said the funeral, because there is a shot of Mrs. Cheney sitting with Ben Cheney, who was then about 12, a very famous photograph, and his tears are just coming down like this on his face. She's holding him, and she's wearing a hat with a veil. It's in the movie, but it's actors this time. So what he's done is he's taken, he's stolen the reality, and he made it his reality. In this particular case, the FBI performed reasonably admirably. I mean, within a few weeks, they had, within a week, they had found the car, and within uh, 35 or 40 days, they found the bodies. And that was damn good police work. And the facts of the matter are quite different. First of all, people don't realize that there was no FBI office in Mississippi at all. And the reason there was none was that the local racists told Hoover they didn't want an FBI office there, and he was afraid of them. And so he didn't put one in the entire state. And that is one of the reasons it took them so long to get going, because they had to get FBI agents coming in from all, all kinds of other places. Even in the movie, it alludes to this, where they set up in the movie theater. You know, they rent a movie theater. Well, actually, they didn't have a, an office in the entire state. The facts are that after these guys disappeared, which was on a Sunday, they were called Sunday night, and they didn't send anybody until Tuesday. And this was after incredible pressure with Rita Schwerner calling the Justice Department with uh, Dr. Goodman and Mr. Goodman, you know, Andy Goodman's parents, who actually got even as high as the President of the United States. This was tremendous, unbelievable pressure. Finally, two days later, they sent somebody around. They were dragged, kicking and screaming, into this case. The first thing they said, whenever you called them, they said, we have no right to intervene. We, we are unable to do anything. That's what they said this very time. That's what they said first. And it was only after incredible pressure and finally people getting to Hoover that they finally decided to do something. Well, there were black FBI agents, number one. In fact, dur during the, the, the hubbub about the movie, a couple of black agents wrote the New York Times and said, we were members of the FBI and we're black. Um, the FBI, for a number of reasons, kept the, the number of black agents kind of secretive. One, because they were probably using most of them to infiltrate civil, the civil rights movement, but they were also using them to infiltrate the Klan. Um, but they were black agents. That's the other thing that made me crazy when I saw the movie and how they get this incredibly fierce-looking black guy who comes in and threatens to castrate the mayor, okay? And then he flies off in an airplane, and somebody says to Gene Hackman, who was that? And he said, that was a special agent, right? Well, of course, there were no special agents like that. The, one of the books that you should read about this whole period called We Are Not Afraid says that at the time, there were five black FBI agents and they were all servants. Fred Zolo painted one picture of Neshoba County in 1964. In his picture, there wasn't a civil rights movement in Neshoba County because blacks were too intimidated by all the violence against them. These things very rarely happen in Neshoba County. I mean, Neshoba and Kemper Counties, if a black person didn't say hello in the correct tone of voice, they beat them up. I mean, this was an occupied section of the state. Um, the notion that there was a large level of unrest amongst blacks in those counties is factually inaccurate. But even Martin Luther King stayed away from the Neshoba and Kemper counties because they shoot you there. To find out the truth about Mississippi and Neshoba County, we traveled there in April of 1990. We talked to people who worked and lived there in 1964. We also retraced the steps of Cheney, Schwerner, and Goodman. We went to the Mount Zion Church, the swamp where the car was found, the Kofo building, we saw the memorial markers, and the building that was the jail where they were held. What was life like for black people in Neshoba County in 1964? It was nothing like the movie portrayed, no, whatsoever. So you saw the movie? 
for you. And what was your reaction to it when you seen it? Uh, just something to make money. <laughs> that was my reaction when I seen it. But it was nothing like that. Black people was not, there was some scared, but there was some was on the line. For years, I paid poll tax for me and my wife, you know, because I was hoping sooner or later that it would, there would be a time that we could uh, vote, you know, because during that time they had some kind of old hillbilly law, I don't know what it was. You pay poll tax so many years before you could vote, you know. So I was doing that. My father and quite a few more people used to go to uh, Mount Bayou, Mississippi to the uh, NAACP. And uh, they used to try to get, to tell the truth, they used to try to get me to go and I wouldn't go. So uh, really, at that time, I didn't think I had time to be fooling with them old folks, but I wish I had it, you know. And this particular day, uh, there was a couple of guys contacted me and said we was having a meeting over at the uh, person's house. And, uh, and I just said, I'm going over there and see what them old folks talking about. Well, when I got there, I didn't find no old folks. I found young folks, people, you know, around my age, I say it that way. And so that, that's really the way that I got involved, you know. What was they, well, we just getting to know each other and the importance of voter registration and uh, the uh, Freedom School and uh, stuff like that. The majority of whites had guns or whatever. They, they was the ruler of, the, of the, the town. I mean, we had to not bow down to their music or dance by their music, but we dealt with, we worked for them, and, and we went to work with them. And, and that, they cut your job off. It wasn't nothing for you to do but to leave. And then your whole family's got to go. Or they could harass you enough to where they throw, burn a cross in your yard. And that's more fear than in shooting in your house. They burn a cross in your yard, then you mar. You know, they know who you are. And that's the more or less that people was afraid to, to get out and be seen or stand up and say, well, I'm going to register to vote. I'm going to help you register to vote. Those people didn't want to be out front and be marked because they didn't know if they was going to live or die. And that's why they, would, they wouldn't participate. Some of them wouldn't participate in, in the movement because they, just, they were just afraid. They wanted to, but they were just afraid. But they helped in other ways. They, they would house people. They wouldn't tell nobody. Well, they would give money to feed these people. Or they would send food to different homes that they know where the people were. They did that until it just got better. Then after everything got better, then they, just, they registered to vote just like everybody else. I didn't know it till later. One of my neighbors was a white guy, and he rode to town with me. And we just I just happened to be going in the courthouse, and some little guy was, he was a little attorney, and he told some of the people, said that I had got involved with the, with the they, COFO at that time, you know. So I had the guy filling with my tax out, and he's, he told me what the man told me, you know. I said, well, no, I'm not really, you know. But at that time, I really, you know, hadn't got really involved, you know. But I tried to make myself real involved after, you know, look like they wanted to have something to say about it, you know. Any of y'all here in the nonviolent side of the movement? Nobody but the movement was in nonviolent. The rest of us was out there on them lines, <laughs> protecting them. In other words, you see, uh, we had to uh, had to set up a line of defense over here. Uh, they had threatened to uh, see a COFO headquarters was in this building up here, right? And uh, they had threatened to. Uh, come over and bomb it, you see. So many of us, after work in the afternoon, you know, took up a line of defense. I told them that in court. I, says, I told them that in court. I said, if we hadn't been, had the least idea that this was going to happen, I said, um, it wouldn't happen like it wouldn't been easy done. No, we, it, it we thought, well, we've been prepared for it. We've been prepared for it. I told them, I said, because black folks will fight back. 
Mm-hmm. They will. They too black to do anything else. They will fight back. <laughs> 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 they will do, fight back. Mm-hmm. It's funny you say that that black people will fight back because did you see the movie Mississippi Burning? Yeah, see it. Yeah. 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 Well, in the movie, they portray blacks as being scared, and just now you said that black people would fight back. They would fight back. Mm-hmm. But in the movie, they would just, they, they portrayed you two as just scared, scared and to lifeless. You tell them they mm-hmm. just lying. <laughs> tell them I've never been scared. They ain't scared yet. No, <laughs> I wasn't born scared. <laughs> I'll fight you. <laughs> yes. You tell them they just lie. That lie. That's a lie they said put on that one. Mm-hmm. No. We ain't scared of nothing. Mm-hmm. We come home that night, We I, I got one doing my wife and then I had a gun, she had a gun. I if told her. anybody drew a pen stop, we don't really have it. If, if, if anybody passed your blood, I said, shoot them. We don't have it. Shoot them, let them have it. And I told you that, I was saying, I had that gun, had a gun ready. Yes, sir, I was going to load it. <laughs> and then all that, all that time, we slept with our doors open. Open doors and windows wide, wide open. Wide open. We didn't close nothing. You were just waiting for them. Huh? You was just waiting for Yes, something. sir. I was ready yeah, for them, too. Ready for, we, I, we just wasn't scared. No, I it wasn't. scared yet. It ain't scared we ain't never been yet. scared. I never been scared. Mm-hmm. We found that you can't find out history by watching Hollywood movies. They have a tendency to distort facts and make them outrageous in order to make money. In order to find out history, you should do research and talk to people who were actually there to claim what is rightfully yours, like we did. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm gonna let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Oh, all in my mind. I'm gonna let it shine All in my mind I'm gonna let it shine All in my mind I'm gonna let it shine Let it shine Let it shine Let it shine Woke up this morning with my mind Stayed on freedom Woke up this morning with my mind stayed, stayed on freedom. Now I woke up this morning with my mind stayed on freedom. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. We walk the walk, we talk the talk with our mind on freedom. We walk the walk, we talk the talk with our mind. Minds on freedom, now we walk the walk, talk the talk with our mind on freedom. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. We shall not, we shall not be moved. We shall not, we shall not be moved just like a tree. That's planted by the water Oh, we shall not be moved